Coming in, Trump picks up ground, even by small numbers. You just don't have that many blue counties where Clinton's going to get vote. The places where she could, you see, there just aren't that many votes. She needs big numbers out of, out of where Milwaukee is. She needs big numbers out of Dane. And there is a chance, though, there is a chance when you look at this map, you'd have to say there is a good chance that Donald Trump's able to offset that with all of this red. We're bringing in uh, Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York right now. Mayor, are you on right now? I am. I'm right here. So tell me, uh, what, uh, there's Judy Nathan, your wife. I mean, uh, this is the first time we've seen you two together, so you must be more optimistic than you've been in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both very good friends of Donald and Melania, personal friends as well as good friends. So we're very, we're very happy for them on a personal basis, and we're very happy for the country. I think this was a... And I hope it works out. We still have a little ways to go. But if it does happen as it looks that it will, this is a real victory for the people. And Chris, I know, I know, I know you're a historian. This is like Andrew Jackson's victory. This is the people beating the establishment. And that's how he posited it right from the beginning. The people are rising up against a government they find to be dysfunctional. And yes, it's a defeat for the Democrats, but this is a defeat for some Republicans, too. Okay, it's 1824 again. So how does the uh, the, the new president, if it's uh, if it's your guy, uh, Donald Trump, how does he reunite this country, all ethnic groups that have felt abused, and I think rightfully so, Hispanic people, Islamic people, uh, all kinds of people out there feel that they've been excluded from the uh, Trump future. What's he going to do? do? What would he do about that I, to, I, I, to heal I, that? I, 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 I do think if you listen to his speeches over the last two months, I don't think a speech went by where he didn't talk about his dedication to truly improving conditions for African Americans, for Hispanics, and for poor people, and for returning the ladder of success that you and I had when we were young, yeah. which means a good education and a good job rather than dependency. This is, this, that was a Jack Kemp candidacy there, really, or a Rudy Giuliani candidacy. And I, I truly believe that a good education and a good job is a lot better than giving somebody welfare. Would you like, to be, would, think, would you like to be part of it? I, I, I like what I'm doing right now, uh, Chris. It's too early for okay. me to think about any, anything we, like we that. we got to call him. Excuse I'm me, just, Mr. Mayor. Excuse me. Uh, in the I, state I, of Georgia, one of the earliest to close, one of the latest to be called Donald Trump, the projected victor there, 16 electoral votes. A lot of talk that the Democrats would uh, be able to convert that. As you see our chart, 244, 209 in the electoral votes. And down on the board, it is a continued march of Republican red sweeping the American South. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, you still on? Okay, we lost him. Well, there you go. That map of red is continuous. It's contiguous. It's crossing the country. Uh, and I still think this election's up in the air. I Arizona. still think Pennsylvania is going to decide this thing. What do you got? This is a change in status for us. Wisconsin, Arizona, too close to call, too close to call. They had both um, been too early before. They had both been too early. Note the percentage of official vote in and note the difference. Um, uh, this is not yet decided. And we haven't heard really from the usual voices you hear when you're about to, you're in a very tough situation from a candidate. We're not hearing their people coming out saying, we still got a good shot. This looks still good for us. We still have a plan. They hadn't had a plan for this time of the evening where they'd have to explain that they could still win. The Clinton yeah. side, you mean? Yeah, the yeah. Clinton side doesn't seem to have a, a second uh, secondary. It's something behind the front line to say, okay, not what we wanted, but right. we got a plan to win here. We're not hearing that yet. What they, we're down to here with these last calls are New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, and Maine. Well, <laughs> yeah, Steve is. That's where, we're at. That's where we're at. You know, I just think this is one of the most amazing nights in political history. It just is. Steve, can you show, are you camera ready? Can you show some of your homework? I see you over there working on uh, combinations. Yeah, take a look. We, we had a thing set up here that was supposed to automatically do I'll do it the old-fashioned way because it's not, it's not working here, but take a look at what is still outstanding and what the paths are right now. If you see Trump sitting at 244, okay, uh, Arizona, we, we too close to call there. If Trump wins that, he picks up 11 there. 244 would become 255, okay? Then you look up here. Now, Maine is one of those states that splits their, uh, their electoral vote by congressional district. Realistically, the 
best Trump's getting out of Maine if he wins that rural district, Bangor, Lewiston, Auburn, all that. He can get one out of Maine. He'd sit there at 256. If he wins New Hampshire, you get four out of New Hampshire. He'd be sitting there at 260. And then again, you take a look at what's left on this map, and you would need... Excuse me, he would need Wisconsin. Wisconsin would put him over. Wisconsin would put him at 270 at that point. Jeez. Jeez. All right. <laughs> the math is getting easier to do. I will say that. <laughs> I know, I have um, as many numbers in your head. Katie Turr is just up the block from us after a 510 day uh, Trump campaign tonight finds her in the ballroom of the New York Hilton Hotel. Katie, we were just saying the, the Clinton communication shop has all but shut down. This is a dark side of the moon period for them. They've shut down on social media, in person, surrogates, you name it. What, what are you learning from there? Well, the Trump campaign is feeling really good. As quiet as the Clinton campaign is, the Trump campaign is jubilant. Sources tell us that inside Trump Tower right now, headquarters, the war room, if you want to call it that, uh, is described as, quote, crazy. Donald Trump is no longer in that room. He had been there with his top aides, his family, and also his running mate, Governor Mike Pence. But now he is upstairs spending some time with his family as the prospect of him becoming the president of the United States becomes suddenly a little little bit more real than it was even earlier today. Um, I can tell you from having crisscrossed this country with him for now 17 or 18 months, what I've seen in almost every city or every city that we have been to, uh, in even some of the bluest states, are people that come out and say that not only are they frustrated with Washington and not only do they like the fact that Donald Trump is somebody who will tell it like it is, but they want someone to go in and just change things. Things up. Somebody who will uh, throw a bomb in the water, if you will. Uh, somebody who promises that they are going to fix things. Somebody who promises that they are going to get things done. And Donald Trump has done that on the campaign trail almost unequivocally, making grand promises that, frankly, would be very hard to get enacted in a Congress. We'll see if that still remains if he wins uh, tonight in a decisive way. Of course, that is still up in the air. And whether or not the Republican maintain control of the Senate. We already know that they're going to maintain control of the House. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the Trump campaign is feeling vindicated. They feel like they've been talking about a movement, one that most people have overlooked or, or discredited. And now they're seeing that movement come to fruition, these underrepresented voters that they were not seeing in the polls, uh, these low propensity voters coming out and voting for Donald Trump. In big, big numbers across this country, Katie Turr, thanks. Lawrence O'Donnell is with uh, former RNC head Michael Steele and uh, a certain James Carville, who we've been listening to this evening. <laughs> That's right. And the conversation never stops here at this table. And uh, James, Wisconsin is looking shaky for Secretary Clinton. Shaky? Yes. That's a, that shaky is about as optimistic a word as, as I can see right now. I think this is... If this thing goes where it looks like it, where I hope it doesn't go, people got to understand this election is going to have consequences like like you can't believe. I was looking with, with Steve Schmidt's presentation, and I think Steve was, if anything, optimistic. Uh, Donald Trump now has the authority of an election behind him. It's it's the biggest thing that you can have in a democracy. You can't. This is not an antiseptic event. This is this is now. He has the, he has the validation of the people, and he was not very. He was he, he said what he was running on. It was pretty clear what, what what he was offering, and you know obviously I'm. I'm you can imagine I'm just wrought about the entire thing. I feel terrible for a lot of people, a lot of my friends, but that, that's what, what is here tonight is hard to put into perspective. We ha we're going to have one party rule in this country, and, and Obamacare is done. Dodd Frank is done. The, the diplomatic and financial consequences, I'm looking out at that, the, the futures are down 719. They're going to go further. I, I have, it, it's hard to imagine what this means. And it, 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 it is no sense in sugarcoating it to people. Uh, I think Wisconsin is, is very problematic. I've been talking yeah. to Chris, and if you just look at what it is, I, 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 I hate to say it, but I, I hope, please, please, God, let me be wrong. <laughs> Michael? Well, look, I, I have to tell you that 
that uh, Donald Trump set out on a mission. He laid out uh, a vision that uh, connected with a lot of people, a lot of folks around the country. And what was fascinating was it didn't matter the state, as, as the map showed. Yeah. They, they used this campaign as a sledgehammer against the established pro political order in this country, top to bottom. Uh, you're right, James. This is a new, a new order here. Yes. This is a brand new space for the country and for the American people. Elections have consequences. We all know that. Uh, and we're all in this together now. So what is going to be important? If the numbers, if the states bear out the way they seem to be, and, and he hits with the next two or three states, hits 270, this is the moment where Donald Trump, is, if he's never done it throughout this campaign, this is the moment when he shows the country he's president. <laughs> and he makes the kind of, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there, because no matter how you cut this, this is a, a huge step forward. Now, everybody who gave the talk about Donald Trump wanting to come together around Hillary Clinton and make it work are now going to have to swallow those words and come to Donald Trump and make it work. Uh, Donald Trump did not run to unify the country. No. That was the last no. thing that he did. The country did not vote to be unified. I mean, I don't mean to be... This was not like a unity and all Americans coming together to, to be one common people with a vision. This was... There are some people, you know, that, that are going to do mm -hmm. something, you know, this and the other people do that. It's very clear what we voted for. He, he did not miss words, and I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. This is not a, this is not, he was not a unity candidate. That wasn't what he ran on. He didn't run on a typical so what, Republican well, so what is, agenda. What is your expectations of, of governing then? Uh, that, that, that we're going to, Obamacare is done. Dodd-Frank is done. Trade agreements let me, let me, let me, But he said that. Uh, so. Yeah, I know. He that's what the American has, people want. Yeah, as, as, yeah, as, right. as we hand it, uh, yeah, as we hand it back Not to... Not complicated. As we hand it back to Brian, <laughs> let me just inject one note here legislatively. Chuck Schumer has just become, or will at the end of this night probably become, the most important player in legislative outcomes in Washington now because he alone in the Senate with parliamentary tactics can tie up or try to tie up anything that this Republican Congress tries to do from repealing Obamacare to repealing Dodd-Frank and all of those things. So there is still Chuck Schumer and the Democrats filibuster power in the face of what we're seeing. That, that's if they hold but a let's, uh, We're rule. getting a little bit ahead of the election results. <laughs> so we're going to go back to Brian for more of that. Well, very true. I mean, uh, if this goes Trump's way, Chuck Schumer of New York will be the senior elected uh, Democrat. And right. And it is without having control of one of the two houses, which is obviously what your party would prefer to have. Right. If you had to only have uh, if you had to be be one minority party figure in a Washington completely controlled by the other party, what you would want to be is the Senate minority leader. You'd want to be um, Chuck Schumer in terms of being able to use the procedures of the Senate to try to block things as they go. I mean, we are still we, we do. We don't really know what the composition of the Senate is yet going to be. We still have. Uh, we do not have a call in the New Hampshire Senate race. We do not have a call in the Pennsylvania Senate race or in the Nevada Senate race or in the Missouri Senate race. We've still got four outstanding. Uh, those numbers will become very, very important. Uh, but we do know that the House will go to the Republicans, that Paul Ryan will at least start this next Congress as Speaker of the House. We haven't yet seen what revenge Donald Trump, if he is elected president, he will take on Paul Ryan. Uh, but Democrats right now, looking ahead to a potential Donald Trump presidency, are trying to figure out what levers of power might exist full stop. I'm also thinking of John Roberts. Does he look around and say, how few justices, really, how many do we need to do this? Um, let's go to Andrea Mitchell over at uh, uh, Clinton headquarters at the uh, Javits Center. Andrea, I imagine that is the biggest shift in mood uh, that you've ever seen in a large ballroom. Uh, you could say that again. It is uh, just palpable. When those states started turning and they began to see these numbers, people just standing shell-shocked. And there's no live entertainment here. They've got the network projections up. They've been piping in speeches like Andrew Cuomo's from outside, Chuck Schumer also, when he declared victory in his own Senate race. So there's no one here to rally this crowd. There's been radio silence except for a few communications that we received without any quotations possible on what they they still believe their path to victory would be uh, to my colleague, Kristen Welker, and me and our other colleagues here. But other than that, 
we have heard nothing from the Clinton family. Uh, earlier in the night, they were so optimistic, they were giving us color details about what uh, little Charlotte, the older grandchild, was wearing. And uh, at that point, they were talking about a victory speech, very frankly. So this is putting uh, enormous, an enormous damper, obviously, on this, and it's a very narrow path now. She yeah. has to, you know, draw a, a, a world straight on the, those remaining states. Uh, Andrea Mitchell, thanks. Uh, Nicole Wallace has rejoined us with uh, some reporting from inside what has been going on in Trump Tower. Yeah, I mean, uh, Chris, you put it to Kellyanne at the beginning of the night about whether he had was prepared to speak to both outcomes. I'm right. told that uh, he just headed back to the residence to work on a victory speech. And, he had the uh, other one ready? I, I don't know that he did. I mean, I'll let her answer, uh, speak to that. But... Um, he had a transition, a traditional transition, run by Chris Christie and some uh, folks with knowledge of how the government works. And um, he was so superstitious about his own long odds that he's really not paid much attention at all. I think the transition period is 78 days. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Um, Mitt Romney, as you might expect, as a business guy, had a, had a, had a really um, well-executed transition plan. Um, Donald Trump also has had a team that's been working in vetting uh, potential nominees for many, many months for a transition. So all the, you know, all these things that no one talked about because we accepted the polls. When someone's ahead by three and a half points, maybe you should be asking more questions. But the work of a transition has been underway, and um, I imagine we'll start hearing information tomorrow. He'll probably get briefed on that for the first time. But I would guess. Tomorrow. Let me ask you this, and 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 include your circle of friends, you and Steve. If it were drawn from the usual folks, you would say, "What a strong bench." <laughs> They have, right? But we can't assume anything. Well, listen. He three years ago he was a Democrat, so I wouldn't assume that you can't assume anything. I mean, who knows? <laughs> I mean, who knows who we'll pick from? Um, so, and 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 a guy that without 15 minutes in government just just you know I think is on his, on his way to, to to winning tonight. So who who knows what he values? In an appointee, I have no idea. But I know that the transition was done by people from inside the GOP establishment, and the people were vetted in a very traditional way. So I think when you start hearing names, they won't be the kind of names that have been floated on the campaign side. That information that's been out in the last 48 hours has come from the campaign. There was a separate entity, a transition, with a transition staff that was doing the actual vetting of potential nominees. Uh, Steve Schmidt, someone getting off a transcontinental flight and walking through... <laughs> The airport and pausing to listen to us right now would see that uh, our talking points don't match up with the known knowns of the graphics. No one's been elected here. What's your view as to what we're, what's happening here? Well, look, I, I think the body language at the Clinton campaign victory party says it all, is that Donald Trump is on the precipice of becoming the president-elect of the United States, of being the uh, commander-in-chief of the world's most powerful military with its most potent nuclear arsenal. And I do think we should spend just a second uh, talking about one of the history-making aspects of tonight, uh, which would be the execution of probably the most successful intelligence operation uh, since the code breaking in the Second World War, uh, where you had a hostile foreign power intervening in an American election, trying to influence its outcome uh, with the WikiLeaks attacks um, and the hacking of the Democratic party in the, in the Clinton emails, and you know, certainly it's had an impact on the, on the election, on her reputation, and uh, you know, maybe an obvious question is why are the Russians so keen on having a candidate of their preference be, be elected, but we we're, we're, just in, we're, we just in, we're just in uncharted territory. Well, Chris, I think every intelligence agency in the country, you know, you talk to, you listen to Mike Morrell, I don't, I don't think there's a lot. You know, you talk to, you listen to Mike Morrell. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of debate about. No, there's about no debate question. about the way they've interrupted. The question right. is what their ultimate motive is. Is well, it I'm the candidate yes, they the want question. to win, or they just want to make us look like less of democracy than we've always seemed to try know. to disrupt us? I don't know. That's an open well, question. Well, I mean, oh, let's, I let's take guess. Trump at his word. I mean, Trump has promised, said one of the things he wants to do is if he, he said if he won, he would like to meet with Vladimir Putin 
Now, as president-elect, even while Barack Obama is still president of the United mm -hmm. States, he wants a one-on-one -on -one Donald Trump, Vladimir yeah, Putin well, meeting. He wants those meetings to start now, yeah. even while we've still got another president uh, filling out the end of his term. So those, I mean, I, I'm sure that's very attractive to Vladimir Putin well, right now to be meeting with one president-elect while you've still got a president. But that's a Logan Act violation. Yeah. He can't negotiate for our government. Before we plan an inauguration, <laughs> let's go get an update from Steve Kornacki on Pennsylvania. Steve? Yeah, this is a state, I think the last time I talked about this, Hillary Clinton had a lead. Seems like a long time ago. Just in the last few seconds, Donald Trump has polled within 7,000 votes statewide of Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania. Now, I can show you what is still out in this state. Uh, Democrats talked a lot about Philadelphia. Chris Matthews has been talking about, he's been getting some info there. His info is good. The Clinton margin's gone up. The Democrats did get their margin out of Philadelphia. This is sitting at about 450, a little north of 450. That's what they needed. Look in the suburbs, though. This is not what they expected. Look at Bucks County. Donald Trump doing as well as Mitt Romney did. In fact, a little better than Mitt Romney did in this county. Remember, we talked so much about the struggles he was supposed to have. But here's the thing. If you look at where the vote is still to come, there's still a little bit of a scattering in the Philadelphia suburbs. Clinton will still get some bounce from there. There might be a little bit left in Philadelphia. The biggest single source, let's see if this is what, uh, what changed. No, the biggest single source of outstanding votes in Pennsylvania appears to be Butler County, which is this just north of Pittsburgh. Give you a sense, four years ago, nearly 100,000 votes were cast in this county. You can see they are just starting to count. This is a red county and Donald Trump, I should say, the red counties you're seeing around Pittsburgh here and really all across Pennsylvania tonight, they're a lot redder than they were four years ago. So Donald Trump's going to get a lot of vote here. One other thing I can show you in Pennsylvania, we talk so much about Scranton. This Lackawanna County where Scranton is, this was an absolute blowout four years ago. Barack Obama won this thing by 28 points over Donald Trump, 28 points. Tonight, Hillary Clinton's winning it by three points. That's the progress Donald Trump has made away from Philadelphia and the suburbs in this state. And that is why, let's see if we've got an update on the vote. Yep, that's why he's within 4,000 votes and closing in Pennsylvania. Overall, 89% of the vote in in Pennsylvania. Mm. Uh, watching these numbers just 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 click up. We're up over 50% in all the outstanding states. Minnesota's got just under 70% of the vote in. Wisconsin's got three quarters of the vote in. Michigan's up over 60%. Uh, we're getting close. These numbers are getting tighter and tighter in terms of just the, the percentage of the vote that's in. At Maine right now, where we still don't have a call, 68% uh, of the vote in. Hillary Clinton appears to be ahead in Maine, uh, but we still don't have a result there either. Well, it shows that the big city came through, but it also shows, you know, I heard another source today that the people out there on the Republican side have a real problem. They hold their nose on Trump, but they do care about the Supreme Court. And, they, and he was able to get people to vote for his party line despite him. I heard that from John Boehner a week ago. I said, what's your message? As you were, he's out there, obviously a private citizen now giving speeches. And he said, my message is exactly as you articulated in the same words, you know, hold your nose and vote for him for the sake of the Supreme Court. It obviously resonated. Yeah. Who knows what he's going to do in the Supreme Court? Exactly. I maintain that we have no exactly. idea what he's going to do about exactly. anything. The fact that he put out a list that he never read, that somebody else right. gave him to put out of the right. Supreme, as his list of Supreme well, Court nominees. How about, we'll how, see. About, see, how about an evening? It's what time is it now? At midnight. Where the Democrats find his hope is how to figure out how to replace M Mitch McConnell with Chuck Schumer. How, what kind of an opposition leader can the Democratic Party fashion? I mean, it's a pretty depressing thing for the Democratic Party right now to say, how obstructionist can we be, as Lawrence pointed out? What role can we play with the 60-vote uh, goal to prevent them from getting anything done? Isn't that a wholesome notion already planning? The Republicans may not know what they're going to do as president, but the Democrats are already planning how they can obstruct it. Well, we don't know if that's what they're planning. Well, I mean, we're, we're talking about it. We're talking about it. But the 60-vote I mean, I do... objective, the 60-vote 60, 60 goal is a way to stop the other side from doing anything. But we don't, we don't have any intel from the, de the Democrats right now in terms of what they're hoping for. But what I, I do think that there's a different dynamic at work here than there would be in a, in a different year's election, which is that Donald Trump has proposed stuff while running for president that is unprecedented in its radicalism. He has proposed banning people from this country on the basis of their religion. He has proposed Sweet banning, bedding. he has proposed a deep nationwide deportation force that would round up more than 10 million people in this country. Terrific. He yeah, has we... proposed building a wall on the southern border. And so if the, if the Democrats are thinking about, well, what are our options? 
I mean, when you're talking about somebody who's brought forward a policy menu that's completely off the chart in terms of what anybody else has proposed, you do start thinking about what your options are within the yeah. realm and of the not, democracy that's that we've not just got. Democrats. I mean, listen, the, the policies you, you mentioned are, are, are appalling. I mean, and, and I think a lot of Republicans, I mean, that was where some of the divide with Paul Ryan came from after the Muslim ban. I mean, the, the two that you named, the mass deportation force and, and the banning of Muslims, most Republicans said were not only not in line with Republican values, they were un-American. So I, I think in terms mm -hmm. of obstructing those two policies, there might be a bipartisan effort to say, well, maybe. Don't, so, you know, I don't know. Maybe. Hope Springs Eternal right. were in the shank of the night. Nick, but but those two policies are appalling. And I don't think he won because of those two policies. You and I had this argument 10 months ago. I think he won despite those appalling, probably un-American and unconstitutional After he proposed ideas. the Muslim ban, nationwide opinion polling of Republican voters showed two-thirds of them were in favor I'm just saying, of the Muslim I don't, ban. We don't see it in the exit poll. I don't think that animated his vote today. I think it was economic despair. Here's, here's yeah. another unusual aspect of this, too, is that so typically you know, a candidate is elected president and we say, well, the other party was defeated. And the reality here is if he becomes president-elect within the next couple of hours, two parties were defeated. The establishment yes. of the Republican yeah, yeah. Party down. went down in flames with the, with the Democratic Party yeah. as, as well, the party of Ronald Reagan party of George Bush 41, George W. Bush, President 43, who we work for, the party doesn't exist anymore. And I'm not sure what the new Republican Party is mm. and what it looks like and what it stands for and how it works with uh, President Trump. I'm not sure what the opposition coalition looks like from a national right. security perspective. I know one thing. I know that John McCain feels a deep commitment to America's security alliances around the world yeah. and believes profoundly uh, that they're essential to maintaining peace in the world. And so I don't know what the new coalition looks like in terms of advancing a President Trump's agenda or in opposition to it. That'll make for an interesting dynamic. Um, Steve Kornacki. What you, you're in Wisconsin right now. Let's take a look. We were looking at a Clinton lead of about, uh, excuse me, a Trump lead of about 60,000 the last time we checked in. That lead has increased. Trump's lead is now closing in on 100,000 votes in Wisconsin. Again, this is the product largely of these rural counties just bit by bit coming in. Surprise Trump strength in Green Bay. Uh, the thing here, Trump also La Crosse County, by the way, still a lot of vote to come in there. Donald Trump with the advantage. Meanwhile, more vote has come in from the two Democrats. Bastions. This is Dane County, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Not all in yet, but again, think of it this way. Four years ago, 300,000 votes were cast here. We are seeing higher turnout this year, but you can see uh, a big chunk of the vote is now in there. Also, Milwaukee County still vote to come in, so Clinton can still make up ground, but Trump can too, and Trump is now sitting on an advantage in Wisconsin that is approaching 100,000 votes. One other thing I want to flag nationally right now. I don't believe I have this graphic I can pull up, but keep this in mind. Yes. We elect the president by the Electoral College. We're looking at the uh, the paths there right now. We are also tracking the popular vote. Right now, the popular vote in this race is sitting at about 50.8 million for Donald Trump, 49.7 for Hillary Clinton. We are j there it is. It's up on the screen right there. Well, there you go. Donald Trump over 51 million. One thing to keep in mind, the single biggest source of votes, raw popular votes that's left on the map is California. It is only started to report right now. Hillary Clinton north of, th of uh, uh, 60 percent of the vote there. She's going to get an enormous popular vote advantage. It is just a seed to plant right now. As we talk about Donald Trump moving along this path to 270, there is simultaneously a path for Hillary Clinton to win the popular vote even if she does not win 270 electoral votes tonight. Wow. You also put the Gary Johnson photo up there in terms of that popular vote. Uh, we've been trying to keep just an informal eye. This is not something that's being tracked from our uh, election desk, but just keeping an informal eye on Gary Johnson's numbers and uh, where third party candidates conceivably might have made a difference. It appears that the third party votes more than account for uh, the margin of victory in Trump states, including um, uh, uh, Florida, uh, in outstanding states where we don't yet have a call, including uh, New Hampshire, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Again, we can't tell you where that third party vote might otherwise have gone, but it looks like, particularly in Florida, which is a state that we've called, that that third party margin um, more than accounts for, for the difference between these two candidates in that state. Can I offer fine. a calming note on the issue of immigration, which is the most hottest issue? We're talking yeah. about banning people because of their religion, which is totally unconstitutional. Uh, 
in the end, if there's going to be a new immigration policy in this country, it's going to have a fulcrum of people that really are responsible people. It's going to be Rubio and it's going to be Lindsey Graham. It's going to be Chuck Schumer. It's going to be, and, and of course, uh, your guy, John McCain. It is going to be a people in the relative center on this question who are relatively pro-immigration. And they are, oh, uh, they are good people about this one issue. I think they are. Yeah. So whoever, left or right, has to cut their deal to win in the center and to get the, the 60 votes, they're, they're, they're going to have to deal there. with these people. So the good thing, if you're concerned about immigration, you want a solution, you want a true comprehensive solution, which is, includes some kind of restraint on illegal hiring, mm -hmm. opportunities for people to become certainly green card people and maybe citizens. There is a route, and it only goes to those guys in the middle. So I'm, I know you think Trump, Donald said, Trump is going to sign an no, immigration No, I'm just saying there's, if there's going to be any change in the immigration law, it's going to have to go through these guys. I can't imagine. I mean, Donald They're Trump. They're not going to build a wall. Donald Trump campaigned on building a no. wall. Donald Trump campaigned on campaigned deporting on. more than 10 million no, people. No. He campaigned on Mexican immigrants being rapists. This is he not a guy on that. who's he not a guy on that. who's going to. It's not sign. a charity. He's not going to sign. He has to sign the legislation. He but will deal where he has to deal to win. He's a big has ended up among the same through two presidents. This debate has ended up in the yeah. hands of the same group of bipartisan right. senators. The, ones the, decide. the late Ted Kennedy was in the middle of it. He was definitely and, in the middle. And John McCain and George W. Bush, and they had an opportunity, a window to do something done. It was ultimately sabotaged by Republicans. But but you're right. I mean, lawmaking is very different than running the kind of campaign he ran. And people are really scared. So I think that's a really important. Most of campaigning is BS. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. It's saying stuff to get votes. When he gets to the presidency, if he's the winner, I don't know who the winner is tonight. Either person has to succeed succeed as president. And the only way you succeed as president is to pass law that you can sign. Right. And, and, that has and that's 60, it. That, that, that has what you described as a 63 percent approval rating among the public. You so. guys, what lesson did the Republican Party just teach itself about the politics of immigration reform? I mean, in the primary, was there any more, wor was there any worse vulnerability for any Republican right. running for office than having been soft on immigration Look, reform, um, right? And then the guy that they picked was not a guy who's just a hardliner on immigration reform. He's the build the wall guy. They're not looking at this thinking, okay. God, you know, we really got to deal with this immigration issue. They took the harder, they went harder and harder and harder line on this. And the people who went the hardest line got the biggest rewards. And that is not a recipe for constructive policymaking on that issue. It's uh, no, I, it's but, not a recipe for any sort of policy making on anything but, that's going to involve any of the centrists that you're talking about. But for sure, we're not going to have a terrific wall with a beautiful door for the good but ones the to come back any more than the dinosaurs thing. are coming back to life. Right? It's not happening. It's not happening, right? I mean, it's fantastical, imaginary we'll stuff. Yeah. I mean, we right. just elect, I mean, we just made a decision here in this country. We're in the process of making a decision here yeah. uh, that a lot of people thought was totally impossible. Uh, well, I'll take the, take the guy at his, take take his word. I'm taking the Faulknerian position, which we will not only endure, we will prevail. <laughs> and I just the Faulknerian position, which we will not only endure, we will prevail. <laughs> and I just accept that view. That's how I lines. survive. We will make it. We will make it even with Trump if it comes to I that. I take the guy at his word. He said he's going to no, do what he says he's going to do. Guantanamo <laughs> is still Ryan. there. Hi. <laughs> let's let's go out to Nevada, uh, where Harry Reid is vacating is. his oh, Senate so. seat, nice seat, and where the the Democrats had the chance to have the first Latina woman in the U.S. Senate, and they appear to have done so. It was tight all the way. Joe Heck, uh, his fortunes kind of rose and fell, and tonight they fell just enough for the Democrats to hold a net hold of this seat. We're going to take a break. We'll have more of our live coverage when we come back. Back, you want to show you the um, this is the Trump ballroom at the New York Hilton Hotel on Sixth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, a stone's throw from our building and across town on the Hudson River on Manhattan's west side, uh, a huge cavernous space inside the Javits Convention Center. Uh, so named for the great former, the late great former New York Republican uh, senator. senator. Uh, there in the middle of um, the United States is uh, the lectern where we were supposed to hear, where we will eventually, one would assume, hear from Hillary Clinton. Um, the crowd uh, came in very jazzed up, high energy. We saw the um, overflow room. 
And then as the first projections came in, the mood started to sour and then darken. And there have been sporadic uh, pictures of people in the crowd in tears, embracing each other, that sort of thing. Mm. Steve Kornacki is at the board with new numbers out of the uh, state of Pennsylvania. Told you a few minutes ago Donald Trump was closing in on the lead in Pennsylvania. Donald Trump now has the lead in Pennsylvania. He's moved ahead by a thousand votes. The reason we told you the biggest source of outstanding votes left on the map in Pennsylvania was right here in Butler County, a Republican bastion that Donald Trump tonight has made more Republican. You can see it's now reported Donald Trump with a very lopsided victory there. That is enough to put him in the lead. A couple of other things, though, going on in this map right now. More vote coming in still from Philadelphia. Chris Matthews is right. They really got the job done there. The Democratic machine now 500, 453,000. Still maybe some more to come out of there. There are still some votes here in the, in the Philadelphia suburbs. Two pieces of bad news for Democrats. Number one, that doesn't necessarily mean their votes for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you can see here, well, actually, this looks like it's just changed. We have it read. Trump and Clinton have been going back and forth here. Clinton now edging ahead of Trump in Bucks County, but they're basically tied there again. The thought here for Democrats was they'd be comfortably ahead in the suburbs. Also this, you see one piece of gray here. There's one county in the state of Pennsylvania yet to report Lebanon County. This is a Republican county. You're going to get at least 60,000 votes out of here. Mitt Romney won this by two to one in 2012. So Donald Trump right now, the biggest single source of votes left on this map belongs to Donald Trump. But there still are scattered votes coming in. You can see Trump's lead sits at about 2,400 right now over Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania. Obviously, Steve Karnacki, you are not making projections from the wall, but it sounds like you can see where Pennsylvania Pennsylvania is going to end from where you stand. Now, there's also some question here. Do we have absentee ballots? If it gets really close here, I mean, you look at a margin like this. If you have absentee ballots, if you have something that's really close, you could say an apparent winner or something. At this point, though, Trump has taken the lead. That's what I'll say for right now. All right, Steve Karnacki. Again, the states that we are watching that are still outstanding at this point, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, New Hampshire, Maine. Uh, that's all that's left on the board. Neither of these candidates has made it to 270. Uh, Trump is significantly closer, and he's within a state or two. This is the time of night we often uh, call in uh, Michael Beschloss, uh, presidential historian, uh, author, and um, a frequent contributor uh, to our to us. Um, Michael, we've had uh, wave elections. We've had trend elections. We've had status quo elections. What? In your personal scope of history, are you comparing the possibility of tonight to? Uh, sure looks like a wave election where there is a trend through all these states. And one thing, Brian, you know, we've talked about all sorts of reasons why the Donald Trump surge happened tonight. One of them is I've been thinking about it all evening. You know, two years ago, exactly this month, President Obama made a little notice comment. He was talking about 2016 and who might succeed him. And he said, you know, it may, be po it may be impossible for me to pass along this job to a Democratic successor. He said, the people may want that new car smell. That was the term he used. You know, uh, 1836, Jackson was able to pass the White House on to his vice president, Martin Van Buren. The next time that happened, you have to go all the way up to 1988, when Ronald Reagan was able to do that for George H.W. Bush. You know, even, for instance, in 1960, when Dwight Eisenhower, very popular president, tried to leave the presidency to Richard Nixon, couldn't do it. Bill Clinton, whose popularity had rebounded by 2000, tried to do it for Al Gore, couldn't do it to such an extent that uh, Gore was able to escape the fate of the recount in a Supreme Court ruling the Democrats lost the White House. So I think as we think about all the reasons why this happened tonight, it's not reason number one, it's not reason number two, but on that list is the fact that structurally it was very hard for President Obama and the Democrats to retain the White House uh, for another term and hand it along to his preferred successor. Heretofore, to ask a structural question, um, they have been members of the kind of party apparatus. This is different because this, um, this is someone, as we've established over months, who kind of burned down the house of the party establishment, plowed right. through all of his competition and every contest uh, during the primaries. 
and wears that as a badge of honor, as we've said many times. This will be, if Donald Trump is elected tonight, this will be the first president that we have ever had with zero military experience, zero public service experience, and also probably the smallest relationship with the leaders of his party of any president that I can think of. Yeah, it's hard to think of a sitting office holder who would be Jeff Sessions in the Senate, uh, Chris Christie, the, the governor for another year of the state of New Jersey. It's difficult when you look at allies, people he could uh, hit the ground working with. Uh, and to not, think only, it that and not only that, if you're thinking of things that we've never seen before, the talk both from Mr. Trump and the people around him that he may undermine the sitting Republican Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, and try to look for someone else and throw Ryan out. Uh, Michael, on that point, I was just about to ask you about that. Are there historical allegories to that sort of thing? I mean, there's been so much interpersonal drama even within parties over the years. I have to believe something like that has happened before, but I don't know about it. Has that I happened before? I can't think of a case where oh, a new dear. president has come in and said, you know, we've got a speaker of my own party, even though I may not like him, uh, I'm going to work with him. That's usually what you hear. I can't think of a case where a new president said, concurrent with my inauguration, I'm going to commit a coup d'etat against the Speaker of the House. Oh, Michael Beschloss, I take such comfort in thinking it's my own ignorance when I think something is unprecedented. <laughs> I always think you're going to tell me, oh, no, 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 it happened in the 1880s and everything was fine. So all right. I can't, can't find any reassurance on that one, Rachel. Oh, great. <laughs> NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss, thank you. A comfort to have you here, if not a comfort in thank the comment. You. Um, I want to also bring back into our conversation now the good and great Chris Hayes, who's been at the news desk for us tonight. Uh, Chris, what do you got? So we've been following uh, some of the, the, the first kind of reverberations of what appears to possibly be, uh, obviously it's not been called at this point, but, but, but the market's beginning to price in the possibility of a Donald Trump presidency. The Dow is down 800. Now, here's an interesting uh, data point. NASDAQ and the S&P 500 have halted trading on the futures market until the opening of equities markets tomorrow because they hit the 5% loss break, which essentially is an automatic emergency break that happens when crashes happen. So that trading's been halted. Um, that gives you a sense of how global financial markets are most likely going to respond if it is the case that Donald Trump pulls out a victory tonight and is declared the president of the United States tomorrow when those markets open. Also, uh, something else has crashed. The Canadian immigration website, this is not like some joke. Uh, it actually is crashed uh, uh, from apparently people's interest there. So we're just now again beginning to see how some of this is going to reverberate out across the world. Uh, there will be a lot more of that if this night continues in its current trajectory. Again, just to just to be clear on that market data, Chris, we've got, it's the Nasdaq and the S&P 500. They have halted trading in futures because they've triggered the that's uh, right. So the, the so, crash warning. Basically. That's right. So there, all those all those markets obviously trade during the day during business hours. There's a futures market for off business hours. The futures market if things are moving in the market while the future while the market's closed people will try to essentially get ahead of that for tomorrow those future markets hit their essentially bottom their automatic automatic break switch they've now opened back up against for trading so we'll continue to monitor those wow. while the dow uh, futures are down up over oh, over 750 chris hayes thank you and you while a lot has happened we're also watching a lot yet to happen we're going to fit a break in here our live coverage continues right after this We are back and we wanted to just take stock of the states that have yet to be called. Pennsylvania and its 20 electoral votes still too close to call. Michigan is also on that list, as is Arizona, still too close to call. Uh, upper Midwest includes Wisconsin. Uh, we just had a projection. This is a call inter oh. interrupting our list. Hillary Clinton is the projected winner in Nevada with its six electoral votes. Here is um, where that leaves us. 244, 215. Trump over Clinton. And here's what the map looks like with the pickup of Nevada for the Clinton campaign. 
you see the coastal argument people have been making. Um, it's uh, pretty hard to deny that we are a coastal blue uh, country. Uh, Steve Kornacki has been looking at uh, the state of Pennsylvania. He's been looking at the path to 270. You name it, he's got it. Let's take a look in Pennsylvania right now in terms of, oh, that's the wrong thing. Let's try to get... Uh, Let's try to get Pennsylvania up here. I'm sorry, this thing is about to collapse, I think. Let's see if we can get in Pennsylvania. Come on, Pennsylvania. Come on. Come on. See? Will it. Click on. I there it, it so. is. Woo. We got everything but the results. Let's see if those come up. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Guys, can you come back to me in a minute? Yeah, we will. <laughs> sure. Unbelievable. In terms of outstanding states right now, we've got six states outstanding. And it's an interesting grouping. We've got Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Uh, we've got New Hampshire and Maine in the Northeast, and then we've got Arizona in the Southwest. So six states outstanding altogether, with Nevada now off the map and in the, in the Democratic side. What was that for, Chris? No, I'm just amazed at the, uh, the ethnic breakout of this, the country, the way it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what's going on. It's, it's mm -hmm. not a pretty picture. No, it's not pretty at all. Yeah, I'm just watching it. When, the, when you get a tremendous black mm -hmm. vote out of the city of Philly, and then you have this mm -hmm. counterpunch. Yes, you do. I mean, you, you had you had um, a very robust turnout among uh, Latinos, among African Americans, yeah. uh, who who came out, who delivered the votes, uh, and uh, uh, but there was a much bigger turnout from those rural areas, from those small towns, um, from those rust, from not just the Rust Belt, actually. I mean, it, it's beyond the Rust Belt. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, th there's, there's obviously a racial divide. There's a, um, a urban area versus um, exurb or small town or rural area yeah. divide. Um, there are lots of ways to split this up and we're gonna um, we're gonna you know spend a lot of time figuring it out yeah, it's uh, not the uh, but it's not the usual result in American history it's center left and a center right party sort of splitting somewhere in the middle this is a different kind of division well, this is and, it, and, and it's, it's um, you know it's troubling it's, in some ways it's you know uh, the America of yesterday versus the America of tomorrow I mean, the America of yesterday yeah. um, appears to be winning tonight. Uh, the America of tomorrow, the America of our demographic future, the America um, that's more cosmopolitan, more connected with the globalized economy, that's doing better from it, um, uh, seems on the verge of losing. Uh, you know, at this point, though, we don't have... We don't, we don't have the final result. We don't have the final demographic splits. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how the country is going to evolve in the future. Like, I don't think that we can say that all the people who, you know, gave Donald Trump these majorities tonight are going to be dead in 10 years, right? It's not, it's not, no, a, it's no, not, a, not, not a, it's not, it's not, it's not, not a it's waning, not it's not a waning demographic. I don't think that the country is shifting away from the groups that are giving him these majorities. If they were, he wouldn't be winning in such big majorities. He's, I mean, he's, right now he's put together a list of wins. Um, that is that's impressive by any Republican standard. He hasn't mm -hmm. taken any deep blue Democratic states. He's just taken every state that was within within. Yeah, reach. but I, what I'm arguing is yeah. that the sorting out that's been going on in America's yeah, right. life is really advancing. Mm -hmm. Where you have big cities which are overwhelmingly liberal, progressive, mm -hmm. if you will, black and white and brown liberals, and then you go right outside and you find another part of the country which is just the opposite. Mm -hmm. This is a divided country, and, right? And I, sorting I would, itself yeah. out. I would just like to point out how badly um, everyone in Washington, D.C. has been disconnected from all of this. Because mm -hmm. I got to tell you, it's not just Democrats shocked, surprised, stunned, probably mm -hmm. saddened by this. It's also all of the Republicans who worked for those 16 other people who ran for president, who I've been, you know, kind of talking to all. And they were yeah. waiting for and Donald defeat. Trump to lose yep. so that they could move on to the next thing. And I have to say, I, I just got off the phone with Senator Lindsey Graham, who is one of those people who obviously ran against Donald Trump and who called some of his comments on American. He didn't vote for him tonight. And now he's saying, OK, well, if Donald Trump is the winner, he's going to be my president. I'm going to have to try to find consensus. He says he will work with Donald Trump to try to repeal Obamacare, do some of these other Republican priorities. He says uh, that he will not. And the quote is, when it comes to being a friend to Putin, count me out. So some early indications from uh, Graham that he wants to be a little bit of a thorn in the side. He also said, for example, that deporting 11 million people who are already here uh, in an undocumented status isn't something that could pass the Senate. That, of course, is a policy that Trump uh, has put forward. 
forward. But I think you're starting to see people in, in Washington grapple with this idea of Donald Trump being in charge that just seemed completely like it was from another planet, even four hours ago. Well, yeah. it, it is. I mean, to the, to the people in Washington, it is from another planet, right? They've never seen, never seen anything know, like I Donald said, Trump. And it will be an amazing thing to, to watch as he comes to Washington, if indeed he does come to Washington. We don't know yet that he will, yeah. but uh, but if he does, right. that's going to be an incredible thing. I, I do think, though, that we, we shouldn't uh, avert our eyes from the fact that, you know, this big vote for Trump, this is not a rainbow coalition out there voting for I mean, it's not. It's just not. Uh, and you look at where these votes are coming from, and you look at who lives in this area. These are over, overwhelmingly white areas of the country. And he did not expand his appeal to encompass uh, people of color. Well, and you know, I, I spent four months on the road with Bernie Sanders, and that should have also been another earlier indicator to the Clinton campaign of just how you know wrong that they may have had some of these things. And those crowds, often overwhelmingly white as well, overwhelmingly often. I, I came away from that feeling almost as though, and ideologically very different, obviously, but Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in many ways had more in common with each other, and Hillary Clinton and Paul Ryan in many ways have more in common with each other than those respective party labels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin is the latest uh, guest Doris. to join us. Well, She's been listening to the coverage, keeping one eye on her television. Well, I guess so. Hey, Doris? I'm not sure I'm listening oh, to the boy. Right. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. that wasn't it's a necessary evil for all of us. Uh, let me correct something that I, in this moment, let me correct something that I said wrong the other day. Yes. Or said just a few moments ago. I said that there were six states outstanding. I forgot Minnesota. To my many friends in Minnesota, I'm sorry. Minnesota also still outstanding at this point and leading uh, and adding to the number of those upper Midwest uh, states in that cluster, that one cluster of the country uh, where we know where we don't yet have um, an answer. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, all outstanding, uh, as well as New Hampshire and Maine in the Northeast and Arizona in the Southwest. Sorry, seven states outstanding. Steve has wrestled his technology to the ground. Yeah. Well, let's see. It's going to probably turn on me again here in the next few minutes, but let's see if I can squeeze this in. <laughs> Big development in Pennsylvania. Donald Trump's lead here just jumped up in the last minute. He now leads Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania. Look at this by 26,000 votes. Remember, we said this has been the white whale for Republicans since 1988. Every Republican candidate says they can flip it. None of them have led this late into the night in Pennsylvania. Now, the question in terms of can Trump hold on to that again, we're saying still a little bit of some scattering of precincts in Philadelphia County and a couple of these suburbs. So there could be more Clinton vote coming out of here. You you also still have precincts left here. This is where Harrisburg is. This is where Hershey is. Still have votes there. But that is countered from Donald Trump's standpoint by this one. Lebanon County has produced 60,000 votes four years ago. This was a two to one Romney County. We don't have a single vote in from here yet. Mm. So Donald Trump stands to pick up ground there as well. His lead, 26,000 votes in Pennsylvania. Wow. Zero vote in from that one county. Do we have any, we don't have any intel as to why that. Well, might. there's a lot of good movies just coming out. You so. know, that's true. It's been a nice day. Nice day <laughs> for a late walk. Um, well, I suppose we're going to get a huge uh, parcel of votes out of Lebanon County, PA at some point here. Yeah. At this point, what we're looking for also is uh, we don't have a lot of reporting on the sources of the delays from these states in terms of why uh, we don't have vote that we don't have. Uh, nobody is more than uh, less than 50 percent out at this point. Arizona, 65 percent of the vote is in. In Maine, 76 percent of the vote is in. Uh, that's still considered too close to call. Hillary Clinton appears to be uh, leading in Maine. Mm -hmm. So it's four electoral votes. Arizona, 11 electoral electoral votes. New Hampshire, four electoral votes. Uh, and then the bigger ones, the big prizes, the double-digit EVs, are Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, with Pennsylvania being the biggest one of those. Uh, Steve just giving us very good prospects there in terms of what's likely to happen with that last Pennsylvania vote. And how interesting. You look at the map, with the exception of Arizona, longitudinally, it's longitudinally. Got it. I cheated myself on a syllable that first time. Uh, it, you could make an argument that it's all up there in the same area. Let's, um, let's take a break, see if we can get any finer reporting on either headquarters. The map has not uh, changed since our call of Nevada for Hillary Clinton. There is Trump headquarters, 6th Avenue, New York City, the New York Hilton Hotel. Across town, a kind of a different picture, different energy at the Javits Center at Clinton headquarters. We're back with more right after this.
We are back. Uh, there is Clinton headquarters inside the cavernous Jacob Javits Center. Much had been made of the fact that the ceiling is glass, made of uh, glass panels. And certainly everyone had theorized, everyone had guessed that would be a central part of what they expected to be a victory speech tonight. As we mentioned, there was a plan that leaked for victory night uh, fireworks over the Hudson River on Manhattan's west side. Those uh, were uh, canceled before they occurred. Kristen Welker is there for us. Kristen, what have you been able to gather there? Brian, the mood is somber here inside the Javits Center. A number of supporters have left in tears. I've been walking around. People have stunned expressions on their faces. One person described it as grief setting in. Now, of course, this race is not over yet, but these supporters are just shocked by what they are seeing. One of Secretary Clinton's supporters and volunteers, Annabelle Avora, joining me right now. She is Cuban. She was born in Puerto Rico. She lived in New York, recently moved, but you just came back so that you could vote and volunteer for Secretary Clinton. Your reaction right now as you await these returns. I came here today to cast my vote and to celebrate and to make history and to break the ceiling. All I want to do right now is just go underground. That's all I want to do. I'm sad. I'm disappointed. And I know it's not over yet, but it really feels like it's almost over. There were so many issues that you were voting for, and that's why you voted for Secretary Clinton. What are your concerns if Donald Trump does, in fact, win tonight? What's your top concern? One of the biggest concerns is that I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor, and I know what it's like not to have access to a doctor or to suffer from pain. And um, considering what's going to go on with the um, deductibles and the, the rise in the deductibles, I'm afraid that people are actually going to be without access to health care and that the numbers are going to rise and it's going to get worse in this country. All right. Annabelle Avora, thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us. Uh, this crowd continues to watch these returns. But again, Brian, it is quiet here tonight, shocked, stunned disbelief as they watch these returns come in. This was not the celebration they were anticipating. They thought they were here to make history, and it is not turning out that way, Brian. Kristen Welker at the Javits Center in New York. Soon, no doubt, we will get reporting as to what's been going on. Clinton headquarters in Brooklyn, the kind of traveling Clinton headquarters in Manhattan, where this was uh, obviously supposed to be a celebration with former president and extended family. Uh, Steve Kornacki is at the board. Steve, do you have any new math? We do. Pennsylvania, we've been monitoring this. Donald Trump's lead has grown. Why has it grown? We said one county was outstanding. That county, ooh, let's get it here. That county has now come in, Lebanon County. You see Donald Trump adding 20,000 votes to his lead. We really are only looking at a scattering of precincts, maybe some absentees left somewhere around the state right now. But Donald Trump sitting there now at a 35,000 vote lead in Pennsylvania if we zoom out that bottom line question here if Hillary Clinton is trying to get to 270 electoral votes at this hour how could she do it uh, she would need uh, a couple of things here first of all if she somehow got a win in Pennsylvania that would be uh, she would get uh, 20 electoral votes if she could get Michigan she trails in Michigan right now that'd be 16 36 to 215 you're sitting at 251 uh, if she could then pick up uh, Minnesota if she could get 10 there she'd be sitting at 261 one, then the best thing would, for her would be Wisconsin. The problem, she's trailing in Wisconsin. We've been showing you all night. That hasn't changed. She continues to, to trail. But if she were to pick up Wisconsin, that's 271. That kind of looks like the, the most viable path, maybe the only viable path here. And I'm not even sure how viable it is because, again, we just showed you she's 35,000 votes behind in Pennsylvania. She's behind in all these states right now. You look in Michigan right now. Look at this. She's running 42,000 votes behind Donald Trump. Now, there's still his vote to come out of Wayne County here. There's also a vote coming out of these Republican areas. She's still behind in Wisconsin. This has been stubborn. She's 90,000 votes behind out there. She'd have to find a way to string all three of those states together. It's pretty much her path right now because Arizona, I can tell you, is not looking good from the Clinton standpoint. 
Steve Kornacki at the board. So, Steve, in, in terms of those in terms of those states that we've got out, obviously, Steve, we've got Alaska coming at the top of this next hour. That is the state that uh, has yet to close. The only state where polls are still open um, in the country. Um, at this point, the Trump campaign uh, is just waiting, basically, for the numbers to fall in place. Um, but we're not, uh, in terms of anything outstanding right now, there's no, there's not really a potential for a surprise here at this at this point, is there? A lot of Democrats, you know, I certainly online I see are talking about Arizona. You look at 11 electoral votes. Here's the reality in Arizona. Two counties are sort of the story of the state. One where Phoenix is, one where Tucson is. And what you see here is it's not what Democrats need. They've tightened the margin from 2012. You see Trump is leading by three points. But I can show you Maricopa County here. Bottom line, the margin shrunk. Romney won this thing by a bigger spread. But Trump is still winning it. This is by far the biggest county in the state. So you see Donald Trump, even by winning with a narrow margin, it's almost 40,000 votes his lead there. And you see, what's the Clinton margin here in the second biggest county? This is where Tucson is. It's just over 40,000 votes. This is an improvement for Democrats and what they saw in this state four years ago. It's why this was a fringe target for them. But right now, it's not enough. When Maricopa and Tucson are just sort of canceling each other out, not going to be enough. And then you see a lot of these areas around the rest of the state are Trump areas. So this one is not looking good for Clinton. If she can't pull a rabbit out of her hat uh, here in Arizona, I can also tell you we have not called it. There's this congressional district, this second congressional district up here in Maine, a rural one. Donald Trump is out to a pretty sizable lead in mm -hmm. that district. Again, stressing we haven't called it. There is also, you wouldn't know it from looking at this map, there's one congressional district here in Omaha. Again, Nebraska, like Maine, gives it out by congressional district. Yeah. That's been close. The Trump lead, though, in that district currently sits at 5,000 vote. So if there were some scenario here where Clinton could pick off that district, sweep Maine, get New Hampshire, the problem is she's running into a hurdle there in Omaha. She's running into a hurdle there in rural Maine as well. So again, it really seems like for Hillary Clinton, if there's any kind of a path here, it's some sort of Rust Belt miracle down in PA, down in Michigan, down in Wisconsin, somehow with very few votes left, got to win all three of them. Steve Karnacki, thank you. Incredible. The, the, amount of, the number of numbers that Steve is able to keep in his head while he goes through those things uh, is stunning. I, I have to say, I keep flashing back to uh, my conversation a week ago, I guess it was, with Bill Weld, with the uh, former Massachusetts Republican that. governor who's yep. uh, running as the vice presidential nominee of the Libertarian Party. And he gave, came on my show and he gave an impassioned, impassioned criticism, uh, just a litany of criticism against Donald Trump. And then he said he was there to vouch for Hillary Clinton. And he said he would not say that he was dropping out of the race. He would not say that people should not vote for the libertarian ticket, uh, but that if they had a choice, people had a choice between Trump and Clinton, uh, he could not have been more emphatic in terms of his, pre his preference uh, for Clinton. But it, it, it matters. Who you, who you vote for, um, not just how you feel. And in all of these states where we are seeing the Johnson uh, number be larger than, significantly not larger than the margin between these two candidates, uh, what they were asking for was an anti-Trump vote, but they weren't willing to say uh, and cast it for Clinton. Uh, that's what they needed to say. And to the extent that the anti-Trump vote was a Gary Johnson vote, that may have made Trump president. It matters, yes. Had there been a pro-Clinton fervor, the likes of which we've seen for Trump tonight, the story we we're covering Absolutely, now yeah. would be different. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin joins us from Boston, Mass., Yay. author and present Yay. presidential historian. Uh, Doris, what are we witnessing? Well, I suspect that the intensity of the feeling for Mr. Trump outweighed our normal predictions that a ground game mattered, that somehow this entire race, we have underestimated the feelings of the people who felt that the political system had let them down over this period of time. But I think the more the worrisome thing for America is it's so close, this election, that whoever is going to be the leader, whether it be Trump or Hillary pulls it out, is going to have a really hard time leading in a polarized The last thing we needed as a polarized nation was to have a polarized election where there may be recounts, where people are going to wonder whether it was went the right way. Will people wonder if the third party undid it? Um, we need some direction. We need somebody to take us forward in a certain way. And what worries me most is that we worry about both these people as leaders. People don't trust either one of them. And we're at a state in our country right now where we need somebody to just make us believe in the public system again. And this election is unlikely to do that. Even if people are happy about Trump, he's going to have a really hard time. If Hillary should pull it out, she's going to have a really hard time. And that shouldn't make anybody happy. The one thing that's good is that people have voted. And, you know,
know, that they have come out in ways that we might not have thought they would. And I don't know whether they're going to feel that sense that their vote mattered. They should. Every individual vote is showing that it's mattering right now. It's incredible how close this is, how, how divided our country is. Doris, you and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago in a different context about um, historical parallels uh, for what we are looking at this year and for the kind of choice that the country had to make. Uh, we are still absorbing what's going on tonight, and uh, we obviously still do not have a call in the presidential race and in a number of states. Um, anything is still possible, but it's looking like Donald Trump is likely to be the winner at the end of tonight. I, I wonder if you, if, if now that we are on that precipice, um, if you feel like there is anything in history that can give us a guide to understanding a character like Donald Trump as a president of the United States, if there's any parallels you see to any historical figures um, in, all your, in all your scholarship. I'm not sure there's a parallel to an historical figure, but I do think there's a parallel to an historical time, for sure. When you look at the feelings that people had in the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the 20th century, they felt the country was changing in ways that they were frightened about. Um, people were moving from farms to cities. There were big monopolies taking over small, small monopolies. There were lots of immigrations coming in from abroad. And the pace of life was speeding up. And there was populism then. There were demagogues then. As it turned out, the Republicans carried it through, and Teddy Roosevelt was able to channel a lot of that anxiety into positive action so that the country moved forward. But I think now you've got that feeling that the country is changing beyond the ways that a lot of people feel. You've got immigrants coming in. There's a sense that cities have overtaken rural areas, and that cultural divide and that sense of inequality that we're feeling is the same that we had at the turn of the 20th century. So that feeling it's almost against modernity. It's against change. And obviously, Mr. Trump has captured that. Again, whether he wins or not, he's come really close to having captured that. And the question is, what do you do with that? Do you channel it in a positive direction? You can't go backward. This is our country. It's becoming more diverse. It's a good thing that it's becoming more diverse. And how are you going to make people feel that sense of fellow feeling once again, rather than one class versus another? The most important thing Teddy Roosevelt once said, a democracy depends on people feeling a sense that they're all in it together. And that's what America's always been so strong about, a diverse nation. And if we're feeling that we've cut each other off now and we're looking backward and forward, it, it's a scary time in that sense. So my hope is that somehow leaders stand up to it, and we need leadership now more than ever. Doris, you know, you write beautifully about the Roosevelts and about the Kennedys. So let's talk about both of them, their political party, the Democrats. Back when Bobby was killed, Daniel Patrick Vaughan wrote a letter to Ted Kennedy, who survived the surviving brother, and said, Daniel Patrick Vaughan wrote a letter to Ted Kennedy, who survived the surviving brother, and said, you can't, we, we've turned away from the white working class. We've left them. They're our people. And, you know, I watched, I've watched them many times, the pictures of the Bobby Kennedy train going through New Jersey, and I've watched the white, dirty faces of the white working class guys saluting the train as it went by with his kid and dirty face saluting. That white working class that probably, I think of them as the guys rooting for the Vikings and the, and the Green Bay, they were tough, big guys. They used to be Democrats. Parents certainly were. How the Democrats get them back? Because if they don't get them back, they're out there. They voted for Trump. They're angry because they feel like they've been... Uh, discarded by the Democratic Party. Do you agree that, with that? I think they were discarded. I don't think helping minorities should have necessarily meant exclude those people and discard them, but they feel discarded and they voted for Trump. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, I mean, you're right about Bobby Kennedy. I mean, he was able to win the minority vote and that white working class vote and go through Indiana and be able to bring those two together. But I'm not sure it's so much that the Democratic Party has discarded them. Certainly not in policy terms have they discarded them. Um, but I think I think we'll see what's happening. We'll see whether they ever come back to the Democratic Party. That's the challenge. That's for sure. The best in the business. Our friend Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, joining us from Boston. Doris, thank you so very much. We're now arrived at the 1 a.m. mark here on the East Coast, and that means the polls have closed in the state of Alaska. We have this to say about Alaska, and that is that it is too early to call between <laughs> Clinton and Trump. Let us, however, uh, look again at the electoral vote totals. Here our bar graph on the side of the building now stands, as we've been chronicling all night, 244 Trump, 215 Clinton. Uh, in the balance is the red and blue. Uh, and this national map that we...
We've been staring at all evening, going back and forth, starting in the east and going to the west with the time zones. Still outstanding, the states in gray, which we will now display. The states that are too close to call. Pennsylvania, too close to call, separated by 46,000 and change. Michigan, the difference of about 60,000 votes, too close to call. Arizona, out in the desert southwest, around 60,000 vote difference. Wisconsin, the Dairy Belt, 84,225 with 87% in. Minnesota with uh, just about 80% of the vote in. And finally, New Hampshire, too close to call, 82%. Look at the difference. <laughs> you think your vote doesn't matter? You think your vote doesn't matter? <laughs> 96 votes between the two of them. Yeah, I said finally, I, I, I uh, almost forgot the great state of Maine, which has been a, a pitched battle all night with 81% of the vote in. 17,000 votes separate four split electoral votes from Maine. Uh, and that's where we have it, 1 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, and we will have no more poll closings. This means that polls are closed uh, throughout the space. country. Yeah. This is it. We've checked. Um, yeah, exactly. We keep going west, but turns out yeah. uh, that's where we are. You see the map there of those seven states of five, the big ones are leading with uh, Trump's leading. The two little ones, Maine and New Hampshire, uh, She's leading in. It's a. Uh, it doesn't look good for Hillary Clinton right now. No. What Steve was saying, it would have to be a Rust Belt miracle yeah. at this point to pull it off. It's hard. It is hard to imagine. But we will wait here and be here uh, until we know. Steve Schmidt, what are you thinking at this hour? Well, I'm, I agree with Chris. I think it's looking very, very dim for Secretary Clinton at this hour. Um, you know, I think that it's almost impossible to see how you pull that inside straight, come back in all of those states. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like she needs one. You know, she has to she has to overcome you know big deficits in in all of those states. So, you know, I think the hour is the hour is drawing close, um, where Donald J. Trump will will be the president elect of the United States. Can I ask a question? Because this is this is somewhat whimsical. Besides Donald Trump, and maybe Kellyanne Conway, and maybe Rudy Giuliani, who's going to be able to say I told you so? This Joe is the shortest Scarborough. list. No, oh, when did he make the call? Joe Scarborough and Mingo have seen the Trump. Oh, when did he make the call? They've seen the Trump thing from the beginning. He made the call? When did he make the they call? They have seen the Trump That's phenomenon so from the uh, beginning. Good loyalty there. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, I, you know, no one. I mean, I look, I, I couldn't have been more wrong about this. You know, I yeah. said you know, she was going to be at 323 to 340 electoral votes. Yeah. You know, I've thought it's been over for weeks. I, you, um, you know, called it right in the primary, but, um, you know, early on. But I, you know, what you're seeing here uh, is just such a backlash um, in the country against the establishment of the country, yeah. a business establishment, a political establishment, a media establishment uh, across the board. And it's really, it's the collapse of trust in institutions that fueled the Brexit vote, Mm -hmm. And it fueled this vote. Uh, Steve Bannon was right, you know, when he talked about the similarities between Brexit, about a rising populism, mm -hmm. and this phenomenon is playing out across all of the Western democracies. And in the next significant global election, you know, is another one where they say in France that Marine Le Pen can't win. You know, she's at 40 percent ceiling. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. But this phenomenon isn't going away anytime soon. I think part of it may well be that uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, uh, the fact that she would, wouldn't be president didn't scare people into voting uh, for her. That there wasn't a sense where maybe with Bernie they would have said, we got to get Bernie mm -hmm. president. We're passionate about it. With Hillary, they said, well, if we liked her, I, I, I might try something out here because I'm not really worried about not having her as president. You know what I mean? Yeah, there wasn't a big stake in her. I think Peggy Noonan, I think, wrote the best, the most astute does. piece about, about the cycle when she wrote about the protected class and the unprotected. Uh, you and, mean the people that main goal in life is to get their kid into Sidwell friends? That's their main goal. 
And she wrote about what you're describing, this, this feeling of people being totally disconnected, and it's happening in Europe, and it's happening mm -hmm. here. And, and you talk about who can say that they, you know, you know, Peggy got a lot of this right. I mean, Peggy Noonan was on to this divide. And, and whether you predicted the outcome correctly or not, there are people that, that sort of were on to this Do you sense. think she voted for Trump? What? I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know, know either. I, I, don't, always, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, Steve, when you were talking about uh, Marine Le Pen, obviously Marine Le Pen is from Front National in, in France. It's seen as a, basically a pseudo-fascist movement movement um, on the far right in France. And her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, was seen as almost almost on the criminal edge of politics um, yeah. in France. And uh, in terms of hate speech and citing violence against immigrants, uh, denying the Holocaust, all sorts of things like that, Marine Le Pen is a sort of shinier uh, version of him, of, of, of her father. Really cleaned up. Yeah. Do you think it's fair to put Trumpism as this, his iteration of republicanism, along the same number line as the sort of British uh, far-right nationalist xenophobic parties like UKIP that was so in favor of Brexit, like uh, the British Union of Fascists, like the yeah, like Marine 100, Le Pen. A hundred percent. I mean, Lafarge was at the convention. Lafarge has been here campaigning for. He went to for, a battleground for, state. For, he for, dropped him into Trump. a rally. Yeah. Yeah. Look, in Mississippi, you know, we, he dropped all, him. All of our lives, I, I talked about this the other night. You know, politics has been divided by a vertical line down the fifty-yard line. It's a, we debate between the forty-five-yard lines, right-left. Right. We have over heated debates about, you know, the difference between justice and injustice is a 39.6 percent tax bracket or a 35 percent tax bracket. But politics now, the line is 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 a lateral line. You know, the people above the line are people who benefited from the technological revolution, have benefited from globalization. And then there's people below the line who've been left behind. Right. The seismic event of this last generation, really fundamentally what this race was about to some degree, is the hangover from the financial crisis. 13 million people lost their homes. 12 million people lost their jobs. The bankers got a trillion dollars in bailouts and no one went to jail. The, the ideological line is permeable. Right? You can move back and forth between the Donald Trump camp and the Bernie Sanders camp. And what, what's increasingly going to define politics is that over under is that over under line. And you're, you're seeing that you know, really play, play out in this in this election cycle with yeah. long term implications. Uh, for for both political parties and and for both coalitions and for the idea of political normalcy for how far apart those those yard lines are that we play that we play between Absolutely. I mean the kinds of the reason he was able to be seen as somebody who would shake up the status quo is because he would say stuff that was seen as politically outrageous all the time because it was way outside those lines I mean the pr proposing to ban Muslims from the United States is a really important part of why Donald Trump was elected not because not based on whether or not you think he's going to do it but because that put him as outside the norm yeah. as somebody who was that on PC yeah, maybe the smartest it. thing that anyone said in this in this campaign was the uh, was Selena Zito, you know, the Pittsburgh Tribune columnist, and you know, she said that now elites elites yeah, said elites uh, take Trump literally but not seriously. And regular people take him seriously, so but not, but not literally. literally. Yeah. And just profoundly, profoundly true. You know, in Hollywood they call they call it below the line. Mm -hmm. So if you're a name brand and you, can, you have a contract and you have a, a good agent, you're above the line. You're a big shot. The below the line people. So what in Hollywood do they portray below the line people as Archie Bunker? And they made fun of him. It turned out Archie Bunker was a popular figure, but the idea was to make fun of him. And so a lot of Americans said, you've been making fun of us a long time. I think we're going to vote against you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of this. We'll see. There's going to be a lot of analysis, but I hope it's better polling than we've had so far. Because uh, nobody predicted this thing. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'd like to get some posters in here and sort of tar and feather them for a while. It'd be kind of fun. <laughs> let's get them talk, in here. Let's There's talk going about to be tarring the, and feathering. Of, yeah, that let's talk about the about. prize in this. Um, uh, after all, is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, correspondent Ron <laughs> Allen is there where some people have gathered in uh, what looks to be Lafayette Park across the street. Ron? Yeah, Brian, we're out here on, right in front of the White House over there, and you can even see where the uh, fencing is put up as they're building the inaugural stage, the reviewing stand. Uh, but there's a huge crowd that's been gathering out here for the past few hours. This was built as an anti-Trump rally, but there are people on both sides of this who are for and against Trump. I think the guys up there on the tree who you might see are people who are supporting Trump, and there are others who are here supporting Hillary Clinton, and they're watching this as we are, and stunned, frankly. Um, here's a couple of folks I met earlier, college students from Georgetown. Now, you are 
You voted for Hillary Clinton. Yeah. How do you feel about what's happening tonight, and why do you think it's happening? We're certainly disappointed about the results. I mean, we're still hopeful for something better to come, but we're not really sure how it's going to turn out. Definitely worried about the possibility of Trump being elected. Have you given up hope? Do you still think there's a chance? Um, to me, what's the most concerning is how over the last two weeks it's been the very predominant sentiment of, oh, Hillary's going to win. All the polls were Hillary's going to win. So there was this like flow of information that was very inaccurate. And it's sort of shown how, with exaggerated voter turnout, mm -hmm. a lot of people have come forward who were sort of not saying they were voting for Trump, who were like, oh, you know. But you think it was that? You wasn't think, You don't think it was this whole idea that people just don't trust Hillary Clinton and that there's that? I don't think so, because, you know, if you look at even from today, five hours ago, the New York Times poll at Hillary Clinton had an 84 percent chance of winning. And then over the course of four hours, that was totally, you know, turned on its head just by people who, you know, due to the stigma attached to voting for Trump, maybe hadn't said they were voting for Trump and then came out. Well, there's a lot of there are a lot of pollsters who are wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, it's, but it's, it's very wrong, apparently, as well. But it's, yeah. again, it's not over yet. What about you? What do you think went wrong for, for Secretary Clinton? I think uh, a lot of the blame is going to go to the DNC for uh, not giving Bernie a chance, I think. And um, well, I think a lot of people voting who voted for Hillary, thinking that she would take Trump in the election earlier, or regretting their decision. Okay, Thanks very much. Again, Brian, uh, a, a huge crowd out here gathering. It's been building through the night. It's very peaceful. People on both sides of this a vigil, you might call it, as we sit and wait to see what happens, how this all plays out. Back to you, Brian, from the White really House. Really interesting. Uh, uh, really interesting responses. The young man who talked about the New York Times index, yeah. which so many, especially elites on the coast, have been following, uh, did flip. Exactly. Yeah. Flipped right over. Around 9.20 p.m. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking at this Politico uh, headline that said, how did everyone get it so wrong? Which will be a conversation and a question that'll uh, take care of a lot of people's nervous energy. Won't change the result, but it'll be fun. And, and you know, uh, seeing, the, seeing the White House behind that as the backdrop to those interviews that Ron was just doing. I mean, the Obama family, I don't know if they're all home tonight, but if you're Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, the kids... You're thinking about, you know, the, your eight years coming to an end, and you've got your lame duck period ahead of you, and you're thinking about these results tonight, and you're thinking about what you thought you never would have to think about in terms of the future of the Democratic Party, in terms of the legacy of having been the first African-American president and the impact that had on this country and the way the country responded to it. Um, it's got to be a really profound, I mean, more than anybody, I sort of want to hear from President Obama. Right now, I don't know when that will be proper. I don't know what the, I don't know what the, there's, we've never had in the modern era, we've never had a popular two-term outgoing president campaign uh, with all his heart for his would-be successor, uh, let alone have that would-be successor then lose. I sort of want to hear from him more than I want to hear from anybody Joe, right now, because I don't know what happens next for Democratic politics. Or Joe Biden, who, you know, uh, has to be wondering what might have been. I mean, he speaks to, he, he is sort of the one We've talked so much, and we spent so much time covering oh for tremendous bench of surrogates, so Michelle Obama, um, President Obama. I mean, I mean we, we Bernie Sanders, yeah. Elizabeth yeah. Warren, I mean, Joe Biden. She just had this extraordinary, but, but nobody on her bench spoke to the mood of the country yeah. or her deficit with voters like Joe Biden. And Mike Barnacle was out with Joe Biden on Sunday and wrote an extraordinary piece in the Daily Beast about, about Joe Biden going home to Scranton and just his day on the trail and his relationship with his agents. And, 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 and he sort of speaks street cop. He speaks working class voter. He speaks to all of the folks who have put all of these states that Steve's been showing us tonight over the line for Trump. And so I think there may be, I think the Obamas are probably having those conversations, but I bet the Biden are having them too. Yeah. But you know, he knows it. If you yeah. talk to Joe Biden without quoting him out of context or off the record, he, uh, he gets it. And he's surrounded by people that don't get it. And he'll talk to you as a guy who gets it about what, it, what they did wrong this time. Steve Kornacki, did they carry uh, Scranton after all? Like a lot of Kennedy. Let's go in Pennsylvania. No, the answer is no, but the margin is oh. three for the Democrats here. This was almost 30 points four years ago. We can tell you pretty much you're looking at all the results from Pennsylvania. There are still some scatterings on here, but look at this margin for Donald Trump now. This thing has crept up. It is now north of 50,000 votes with what is left here. There's always the possibility of some absentees we've got to figure out. It is tough to see. It is very tough to see a 50,000 vote deficit being made up by anyone 
anyone with what's left on here. We said pretty much right now, Hillary Clinton, to get to 270, for all intents and purposes, she's got to find a way to win Pennsylvania. I just showed you what's going on there. She's got to find a way to win Michigan. Check this out. Donald Trump's lead here right now, sitting just over 70,000. The good news here for Democrats, there is a, a, a real shot for Hillary Clinton when you look. A lot of votes still in Wayne County. A lot of votes still to come out of here where the University of Michigan is. She could still net a significant share of the vote there. There's still some in Macomb, too, a big suburban county, blue-collar county that Donald Trump is winning tonight. Uh, so Clinton does have a shot at Michigan, but again, it's not just Michigan she needs. This, though, this, though, look at the news for Democrats here in Wisconsin. Again, 1984, last time a Republican carried this state, Donald Trump's margin here is sitting at 85,000 votes. There are... Yep. I was hearing something in my ear there. I th oh. thought that was an urgent call. Quickly, I could just finish oh. Milwaukee and Madison. The two that are left, it does not look like they are going to produce. The two big ones left for Democrats, oh. doesn't look like they'll produce that kind of a plurality. There's a problem with your board, and they say we can't touch it till we fix the bug. So step <laughs> away. That's what they wanted me to tell you that's a problem with the board. Step away from the board. Right. <laughs> Steve is like, wow. I'm happy to step away from the board. Okay. I'm worried that Steve's going to shoot the board at I some know. point. In the We've got, of the we're going to have to have a board meeting. Uh, <laughs> poor board. Poor Steve. Um, and the, we're going to take a break because that's what people do in this situation. Uh, 1 16 a.m., a lot still to cover. A very, very moving, moving uh, uh, situation. A movable target here. Let's put it that way. There is your political nation superimposed over the rink here outside our building. A vast area of red in the middle, stretching just about out to both coasts. Eight states still grayed out. That's what we're watching. Race to 270 is what we're calling it. Donald Trump is at 244. He needs 26 more projected electoral votes. It is a much harder climb, not just the math, but the physics of it for Hillary Clinton. 215 1. 55 more needed. Uh, you have to look uh, long and hard to see uh, anyone who predicted this kind of outcome at this hour for tonight. 121 a.m. The states in gray uh, have not been projected, but you see the colors of our nation there on the map. Eight states not called, as we've been saying, as our coverage has um, uh, continued on through the night. Lawrence O'Donnell is with uh, his insider guests in his studio. Lawrence. Brian, we're here with Maria Teresa Kumar and Michael Steele, and we've been discussing this issue of the polls, and as the pollsters are going to get savaged, but... Yeah. Uh, all of the polls had this within the margin of error. Hillary Clinton's national lead was within a margin of error. Uh, the, the Florida polls, all of them were within the three points. Yeah, they essentially got them right. They, they, they essentially figured out what the landscape would look like. But there were still some elements of this race that sort of popped up, particularly in some of these states where you, you're looking and you're going, look at the overperformance of the white vote in mm -hmm. certain parts of the state. And, and, and talking to people and calling around, essentially what's happened is the Reagan Democrats have come back to Trump. Right. Well, and I think it's and gonna, that's made the difference here. Well, and I think it's, it's going to be interesting because everybody kept saying that Republican women were going to pull for Hillary, and mm -hmm. they clearly did not. And part of me wonders, what was the Comey effect? Because she had them, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, Comey came out. So I think that will always linger in people's minds. But right now, I'm getting emails from folks. Everybody's really worried about the community, the uh, mm -hmm. Muslim American community, the Latino community. And if Trump becomes the president, he's going to have to figure out how to... People who have felt threatened by this candidacy are feeling... Los what are they feeling An tonight? Los Angeles County. 
has had an increase of 24% in hate crimes since the candidacy was announced. And this is a bastion of liberalism in California. In my hometown, where I went to high school last week, an elementary school that was Spanish dominant, got spray painted with build the wall higher. Moms that had basically to tell their elementary school, te their kids of five years old, of what happened to their school. So if, if Trump wins, he's going to have to have a conversation that turns down the temperature, that makes people feel inclusive, and he has to act presidential. And that's what Muslim Americans and Latinos and Asians are looking for right now. Michael, is there a, a version of this in which Donald Trump uh, f finally sees that he's won if he has won? And he doesn't, in his next speech, have to try to win votes by being yeah. inflammatory. Yeah. In his, that's not part of his next speech if he has won. Is there anyone there, and, and is there a part of Donald Trump that could hear the advice of now is the time to not to do everything you can right. to not sound threatening to anyone? I, I, I think there is, and I, and I think this is where, uh, if this thing plays out with one state to go. Uh, this is where Kellyanne Conway in his ear will be very, very important because the, the first most important thing you do when you run, uh, when you're running for president is to select your nominee, your vice presidential. The second is on the night you win and you address the nation because that then gives some clues, not on policy, not on any of that stuff, but on how you want to bring the country it's together. To your down. point, Maria, mm -hmm. uh, bring people together and have people realize, okay, this vote was worth it. I think he can do that. I hope he can do that. He needs to do that. Well, he quickly. needs to because I think right now, otherwise, we're going to have a Brexit moment where all of a sudden people have sticker shock and they're like, oh, shoot, what happened? Because it's not just that we're giving him the White House, the Senate, the Congress, but also the Supreme Court. Brian, back to you. I think the yes. moment of truth for Donald Trump tonight, if he gives a speech and here's chance of lock her up, what does President-elect Trump say in the face of chance of lock her up? Among so many questions at 1.25 a.m. Eastern Time, so much we don't know yet. Steve Kornacki has come to an understanding with his technology. <laughs> They've reached a working agreement. You all right? Well, we'll see if he can hold up his end of the deal here, this big right. board. I'm going to have some words after this show tonight. Uh, so, look, exit polls here. We talked about this a lot in the run-up to this election. That split among white voters, college, non-college. We can tell you two things about that tonight, though. First of all, look, we said those early exit polls we showed you might change. They did a little bit. Donald Trump did better than we were initially telling you he did among white voters with a college degree. He wins by four points. Now, this is down from Romney by 14, but I have to say, this is a lot lot better than people thought Donald Trump was going to do with white voters with a college degree. They returned to the Republican fold in the stretch in this campaign. That's what it looked like. The other thing, non-college whites, that number tonight is 39. It was 26 four years ago. Here's the other thing, raising eyebrows. Again, we said we were keeping an eye on the Latino vote. As we've gotten more into the exit poll, now we can tell you, look at this. This is a surprise to a lot of people. Clinton wins the Latino vote 65-29 tonight. I just want you to remember, four years ago, the margin was Obama 71, Romney 27. That was a 44-point spread. Tonight, the margin you're seeing, it's only 36 points. It's actually gone down in four years. Republicans did eight points better tonight with Latino voters, net, than Mitt Romney did four years ago. Now, think about that in the context of this campaign where all of the conventional wisdom said that number, that 27, was only going to go down. It was going to be somewhere in the teens. According to our exit poll, Donald Trump lands two points higher than Mitt Romney did, loses by eight points less than Mitt Romney did with the Latino vote. But make no mistake about it, when you see the states on this path to 270 that Donald Trump is carving tonight, what's doing this for Donald Trump, it's the white vote. Four years ago, yep. people were saying after the election, no Republican could go higher than Mitt Romney did. Donald Trump's proven you can. You know, on, on this Hispanic number two, it's fascinating because you're right. Donald Trump, if that number holds, he's doing better than Mitt Romney did with Latino voters. He's still doing worse than John McCain did with Latino voters. And the way he's making up for that, the way that isn't a fatal number, is by spiking the white vote. This is something that I, t I talked about at the very beginning of the night, Chris, and you said you disagreed with me on it. But I do feel like 
a lot of the really ragged racial edge of what Donald Trump has proposed was designed to change the behavior of white people, to tap into a type of white vote and enthusiasm among white voters that was going to obliterate anything you might otherwise need to get from people of color. I mean, we do have Clinton underperforming Barack Obama with Latinos. We have Clinton underperforming Barack Obama with African Americans, although that was expected. What we've got, though, the biggest number and the biggest thing that explains how Trump could maybe win the presidency with only 29% of the Latino vote is that he's spiked white vote. He has figured out a way to do that. And that has always been the far right's dream, that you could figure out a way to do it without minorities. In <clears> fact, <throat> you could figure out a way to do it on the backs of minorities by threatening minorities in a way that make a lot mm. of people uncomfortable, but by, that, do, that does awaken something uh, basically in the, in, in the, in, in, uh, that's racial anxiety among whites. Um, and, and that's how you win. That's been a dream on the far yeah, right. Um, it's the Ann Coulter dream of white turning. Well, let me give the other version of that notion. The way he did it was. This is the way important. he did it part of how he did it. I have two tasks. Number, well, th give me three. Number one, it took Joe Biden to call LaGuardia a third world airport. And then you saw Governor Cuomo trying to decide how to react to that. Uh, and that's like Trump. amateur now, calling LaGuardia a third world airport. We're decide that. Uh, Casey Hunt has some reporting and Mike Murphy joins us in the newsroom. Casey, what did you just learn? Well, I mean, one thing I've been doing tonight is reaching out to people who worked for Bernie Sanders because they feel like they, you know, learned a lot of lessons uh, from their campaign. And I'm told Bernie and Jane Sanders themselves very saddened by what appears to be uh, a looming Donald Trump win. Obviously, we haven't called uh, that yet. Uh, and everyone that worked for them, uh, for the most part, very upset about it. But there's a little bit of an element of I told you so, that you didn't pay attention to what was going on, that you didn't kind of embrace Bernie. Bernie Sanders' uh, ideas and approach early enough, and that it's cost them. Uh, Mike Murphy, you've been uh, politely listening to all of this. Was surprised to hear Michael Steele in the last conversation, and I'll I see him. I'll raise this with him. Um, say that the pollsters essentially got this right. Um, they essentially did not get this right. We're covering a story that no one saw yeah. coming. Well, my crystal ball has been shattered into atoms here because I predicted the exact opposite of what happened. But I'm a typical, you know, campaign consultant type that we've been living and dying by data for a long time. And tonight, data kind of died. Uh, the exit polls originally were off. The polling beforehand, the most credible polling was off. And Trump has built kind of a new model here. And I think it had two parts. One is he had resonant issues. People want to change. They want to punish politics. And I agree with some of the stuff Chris said about how the working middle class has had it. And this is how they riot. They vote for people that, that the establishment thinks are irresponsible. But the other half, and we can't, we can't miss this, is what a big, big, generic Republican wave it was. There was a real repudiation of Hillary Clinton and I think the Obama third term. It needed two pieces to be such a different kind of thing. And I think they were both very, very powerful. So there's going to be a lot of soul searching should Trump win. And looking at the numbers, I think that's more likely uh, than not in the Democratic Party as well as in the Republican establishment. What did the prairie fire of Bernie Sanders and the prairie fire of Donald Trump have in common? They, they had a lot in common within that universe of primary voters because they both told people of different demographies that who believe the basically the American dream was a, in, not in a good position for them. They may not ever achieve it, that there was an enemy. With Bernie, it was, you know, Wall Street, the money's in a vault. You ought to get it. You can get that Ph.D. in yoga for free. With Trump, it was to the machinist in Detroit who is seeing jobs that they worked 20 years to get that are high wage jobs leave the country. And so the enemy is Mexico and foreign who are taking your jobs. Both were selling grievance politics with different kind of resentment to people who had lost faith in the American dream and have been through a lot of economic pain. It comes from a real place. I'm from Detroit. I have relatives who, you know, see the machine tools they worked on dismantled and put on freight cars to Mexico. Um, how much of the blame when Clinton supporters look to blame uh, things or people. How much of the blame do you think Governor Johnson correctly will get? I think the third party people will be in some from, for some blame from both. But the forces were bigger than that. that yeah. That's a tactical thing. But they the, Hillary Clinton was brutally repudiated tonight. And Donald Trump's most populist arguments, rough as they were, were embraced. 
he's arguing there that uh, both were grievance politics candidates, sure, but they, they were selling grievance politics. They were also selling authenticity, and they were selling, you know, something, telling people something that was real and not something that was packaged. And I, I don't think we should forget we spent the last few months of this campaign reading through the emails of somebody who is essentially exposing just how, blow by blow, Hillary Clinton comes to decide where is she going to be on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? What is she going to say? Instead of seeing, oh, this is somebody who believes very strongly that globalization is a force for good or that she doesn't and she thinks it's a force that's decimating the economy. I think people are rejecting that as well in this. Which is, you know, hats off to the Russian government, right? I mean, if we were all looking at, if we were all combing through the email trains, the email chains amid all the different Trump campaign forces uh, trying to figure out how they came up with some of his policies and got him to say some of the things that he said would also have been a blow to the, his apparent authenticity. Um, that is something that didn't happen because WikiLeaks only went after Clinton. On the other hand, though, it also simply told voters what they felt they already knew about Hillary Clinton. Right. I telling telling, telling voters that something surprising is potentially even more fatal, right? Potentially. Uh, a break for us. When we come back, we're going to check in with Katie Turr at Trump headquarters. We have two campaigns in kind of a suspended animation, a holding pattern. One campaign, uh, unlike the other, expecting to have some very good news when tonight is out. There is Trump headquarters, New York Hilton, 6th Avenue, not far from here, Midtown Manhattan. Uh, Clinton headquarters, a far, far different picture uh, uh, over at the uh, Jacob Javits uh, Convention Center on the west side of Manhattan. Our coverage will continue after a break. We are back two very different evenings at two very different headquarters and in a way kind of uh, mirror reflections of the ethos of those two campaigns. The Make America Great Red Hats have been distributed in the Hilton Ballroom in New York. Uh, the American flags uh, behind the teleprompter uh, with the Trump Pence placard in front of the podium. Uh, on the west side of Manhattan, inside the glass-ceilinged Jacob Javits Convention Center, which almost bore the name Donald Trump, uh, were it not for some last-minute construction maneuvering back in the day. There's the lectern. Again, this looks like night three at the Democratic Convention. Elaborate, huge staging. They were candidly expecting a victory celebration uh, down to what was once a plan for fireworks over the Hudson River since canceled when cooler heads prevailed a few days back after the, that plan uh, became public. Uh, Katie Turr is at Trump headquarters having covered the Trump campaign for low these 510 days if I read your Twitter feed correctly today, Katie. Uh, yeah, I think I've done about 500 days with the Trump campaign. Uh, Donald Trump is said to be wanting to come out. He's itching to come out and address the crowd and give his speech. But he is, I'm told by a senior source, awaiting the, uh, the allocation of 270 electoral votes. Uh, I just want to remind people a little bit about Donald Trump uh, at this late hour and what the questions that still are outstanding about him. We still have not seen Donald Trump's taxes. There are still questions surrounding his business and how he would deal with the potential conflict of interest. He's talked about a blind trust going to his kids, uh, but that technically is not really a blind trust. There's also still questions surrounding his relationship with Russia. These are all things that are unanswered at this time. And he also has not addressed, directly at least in recent months, what he would do about his Muslim ban. He's called it a banning Muslim Muslims or extremists from territories or states where there is radical Islam. That number uh, is quite high if you consider uh, countries like France, which have had attacks on their soil, uh, even attacks.
attacks here in the U.S. It's unclear how that would happen. Um, he has been talking about what he calls extreme vetting, even potentially a Muslim registration, which we haven't heard him uh, completely rebuke. Uh, he also has said that he's going to build this wall. We all know this. Uh, but he said he would end Obamacare uh, in his first 100 days in office by executive order. He has said he would rip up the Iran deal. These are things that are hard to do alone, but it's increasingly looking like he's going to have uh, the House and potentially the Senate on his side. And if he uh, makes a run with the rest of the states that are on the electoral map right now, you could essentially argue that he has a mandate. So how his first 100 days in office uh, would shape up to be is certainly an open question. There's also the question of who would occupy his cabinet. Uh, in the last few days, those talks have been ongoing and, and more earnest than they had been before. Donald Trump refusing to take part in those talks out of superstition. But the names that we heard, and these are just very preliminary names, and obviously nothing is set in stone, and these names could be something uh, that don't ever come to be. But Newt, Gring Newt Gingrich as Secretary of State, Rudy Giuliani as Attorney General, Reince Priebus maybe as Chief of Staff. There's even rumors out there uh, that Corey Lewandowski could head up the RNC. That would show how disconnected the Republican Party has come with its base and how they would want to completely change direction. Of course, all of this is very preliminary, and there are still, there's still a lot of work to be done. This transition had been head up by Governor Chris Christie, but he has uh, sort of faded into the background in recent months. Now we're told that Jeff Sessions has taken a larger role. We're going to find out what they will be doing in this next three months. After all, uh, Donald Trump hasn't been involved in these talks. You can hear the crowd behind me. They are obviously very excited for Donald Trump to take the stage. They are chanting right now, call it, call it. They're watching Fox News. They believe that this race is over. They just want to hear it. Katie Turr, thank you. It'll take us years to discuss all that needs to be talked about uh, coming out of, um, of tonight. We have a call on the Missouri Senate race. It's really attracted so much attention. The Democrats thought they could eke out a pickup this race, as I was saying earlier, on pure technical grounds, probably gave us the craftiest ad of, of this campaign. The gentleman on the right, Jason Kander, the Democrat who has gone down in defeat, uh, showed that he could assemble an AR-15 blindfolded as countless members of the U.S. Armed Forces and law enforcement can do. Uh, but it was about guns as an issue in this race. And one ad does not a Senate race or a wave election make. And so uh, it's, a, um, it's a net hold for the Republicans. But uh, Mr. Blunt, the uh, veteran Republican from Missouri, always an interesting political state, is going back to the Senate. Steve Kornacki, having forged an alliance with his technology, huh. is back at the board. Steve? Uh, me and this thing after the show. Is <laughs> <laughs> Take it out back. Yeah. Okay. So we planted the seed earlier. We talked about, look, uh, to be elected president, it's all about the Electoral College. Make that very clear. But we are also keeping track of the national popular vote, and I think this is at least worth pointing out. Let's put on the screen right now what the national popular vote is at the this moment. You see Donald Trump with a lead there over Hillary Clinton of about 1.2 million votes. However, most of the vote that is outstanding on this map right now, it's heavily tilted toward the West Coast, more specifically toward the state of California. Look, this is an easy Clinton win, but here's the thing. California, obviously, it's gigantic. Only about a third of the vote is in in California right now. And you see Hillary Clinton is already leading by 1.2 million votes. Now, Barack Obama's margin over California four years ago, and Clinton is on pace to match or maybe even exceed that margin. His margin was north of 3 million votes. So we are likely to tack on an additional 2 million votes to this margin for Hillary Clinton. Remember what I just showed you. Hillary Clinton's losing the national popular vote now by 1.2 million votes. Now, there are places on this map where Donald Trump's going to gain votes. We still have votes coming in in Idaho, in Utah, and Alaska. These are smaller places 
We also have votes coming in in Washington state where Hillary Clinton's winning big, in Oregon where she's winning big. So I just, we, I said earlier I was planting a seed, now getting a little bit more serious about it. The last time we saw this was in the year 2000. Al Gore lost the, oh, excuse me, won the popular vote in the year 2000 by about half a million votes. And of course, in that Supreme Court decision, lost the state of Florida, lost the Electoral College, lost the presidency. Now, 16 years later, certainly as these numbers come in, the possibility is alive of Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote tonight, but losing the Electoral College and then losing the presidency. If, if Hillary Clinton wins the popular vote tonight, even if she doesn't win the presidency, that will mean Democrats have won the popular vote in six out of the last seven elections. It's the first time the Democratic Party has ever pulled that off in the history of the current two parties that we've got. The last time it was pulled off was by the Republican Party. Um, in the era of the formation of the Republican Party, like 1860 uh, to 1888. If, if Clinton wins the popular vote, and those, those, those California numbers that Steve was just saying suggest that will be true, um, this will also be the second time in recent memory where a Democrat wins the popular vote but loses the Electoral College. So much talk tonight about the pollsters. Perhaps you may have heard this talk. Perhaps you may have participated in it. I am told Lawrence O'Donnell, in his insider segment, has more than one pollster inside a room tonight. We're going to lock the doors until you get some answers, Lawrence. We've got a couple here to confess, Brian. We have Bill McInturf, who is a Republican pollster. We have Fred Yang, who's a Democratic pollster. Bill, let's start with you. What did the polls get right? What did they get wrong? Well, what they got right was the shape and the contour of this wrong right, of this race. What they got wrong is the margins. So, for example, in all of our polling, we showed Trump ahead 25 points with white non-college, about what about what Romney got, except he won by 35 tonight. That's a net 10 points extra. They're 34 percent of the vote. That's 3.4 percent more of the whole electorate. Um, so, uh, then the other change is that. Um, uh, Trump did much better tonight with white women college plus. He lost them, but he lost them by single digits. And most of the public polling, he's been losing by literally 15 or 20 points. Uh, but it's a reminder, like these margins in rural America where he won by 62, uh, 34, that campaigns are about margins. And, and at the margin, because of margins, it's reshaping the map in the Midwest and reshaping the presidency. Uh, but, uh, Fred, the, all of these polls carry a margin of error, usually about three points, which means if, if it says Trump's at 44, he might be as high as 47, he might be as low as 41. Right. So it's really a band of possibility. Is, are the outcomes we're seeing tonight within that band of predicted possibility? I would agree, yes. I think, um, I think um, tacking on to what Bill said, I think that in the battleground states, which mm -hmm. because they're battleground states, they're 50-50 states, and today Mrs. Clinton was on the wrong end of 50-50. I think some of the margins um, that um, we saw in some of the earlier polling compared to 2012 just didn't bear out. She didn't do as well with Latinos. She didn't do as well with um, with um, white women. She didn't do as well with millennials. She only won um, 18 to 29 year olds by 17 percent. Barack Obama carried that group by 23 percent. So I mean, look, I think um, I think there were a lot of polls, not every poll, a lot of polls converged to suggest that this would be a two, three, four point victory for Mrs. Clinton. As you pointed out, though, that's within the margin of error. And as uh, Steve Kornacki pointed out, um, we could still have a situation in which she, quote unquote, won the poll, national poll, mm -hmm. right? But because we have an electoral college system, she loses the election. And Bill, is there anything in the exit polls that, that you would see as the chief explainers of these outcomes? I think the chief explores what I said, which is the margins by uh, men and women who didn't graduate from college. Mm -hmm. These are extraordinary. He's in the mid-60s, and just to put this in perspective, he's winning today white non-college voters more than Ronald Reagan did in 1980 against Jimmy Carter. Uh, that's 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 a huge deal. A quick last word. Did the tools work? Or is it a, a within the margin of error? And therefore, this is what the tools well, predicted. I would argue that um, as as we sh as we do, we, we focus on the horse race aspect. Yeah. Even our last poll we conducted for NBC News Wall Street Journal, there were a bunch of questions which suggested that this is an electorate wanting major change. I, I just don't. I just think that we thought that. Donald Trump was not that candidate to bring that change and you know they've spoke tonight and this country that wanted change 
That's why, that's why we count the votes. <laughs> Brian, back to you. Can I, uh, uh, Lawrence, I want to ask you a question to put to those guys, sure. which is what Rachel asked about a couple hours ago, which is a great question. If this was a change vote where people said, throw the rascals out, how come they didn't throw the rascals out? We haven't heard tonight of any massive defeat of incumbents mm -hmm. in, the, in the House or the, or the Senate. So why just pick him but keep the usual uh, tongue together of uh, the establishment? Great question. And Fred, you were just talking about that, that it indicated this was a, a, a change election. But what happened to all these incumbents who got uh, reelected? I'm sorry. Change never means change. It means, means change the party in power. The Democrats have been in power for eight years. The president Why doesn't it mean change the senator in power? It, it never does and every time every wave off your election they say we want change I'm sorry you know what it changes the party in power mm -hmm. and despite President Obama's good standing tonight and his own approval they've been there a long time she offered more of the same and people said no I think the other thing to remember tonight is in in most polling there was 10 to 12 percent between third and fourth party voter undecided well third party vote dropped as always they tipped Republican and again to Nate Silver's credit when Silver kept saying hey, there's about a 30% chance yeah. this guy can win because there's a lot more slide than there are in most polls. That's This is why he did a nice job representing all the time. I'm sorry, there's about a 30% chance we're going to see a President Trump. And tonight, you know, you flip the coin 10 times and we got the three, we got one of the three. And right. how many how many late deciders were there? Because there was so much happening the last 11 days with the regard to the FBI, where you had a big turn against Hillary in terms of what the news was, then a turn of relief back to her very recently, right before the election. Did that affect the voting, can you tell? Fred. Well, Chris, in the exit polls, 13% um, of the electorate in the exit polls um, said they decided in the last week or, 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 more, or, or more recently. And among mm -hmm. that 13%, they voted for Trump by five points, 47-42 and another 9% going to the third party candidates. So I think, um, um, you know, um, the, the Mrs. Clinton's margin was predicated in some respects with the third and fourth party candidates. And it's interesting, in the exit polls, groups where she did well with also had a higher share of the third and fourth party vote than groups she didn't do well with. And I think that just goes to um, the, the, the change argument. And the final thing I want to say about the change argument is there's another neat um, item in the exit poll. 17% of the American public said they wanted a president whose policies would be more liberal than Barack Obama's, 17%. And among that cohort, they voted for Hillary Clinton by big margins, but by only 70 to 23. In other words, 23% of voters who said they wanted a president whose policies were more, more, more liberal than Donald Trump, but then Barack Obama voted for Donald Trump. And we had a very significant percentage of Trump voters saying in exit polls they don't think he has the right temperament to be president. Well, today they had to make a choice. 18% of the folks said they didn't like either candidate. That's three times the normal the normal amount. He, Trump, won those people 49-29. Of the ones who didn't want either candidate, right, who Trump were, won them. 49-29, uh, which again, to me, represents what we're, I guess, what yeah. we're trying to say is, I'm sorry, uh, you know, here's, here's an artsy line. De Tocqueville and Democracy in America said, Americans are the only people in the world who would build a dream house and move before the roof is finished. <laughs> it's very hard to get a to get a third term for one party. It doesn't happen very often. It's harder still in modern America. Brian, back to you. All right, Lawrence. Boy, so much there to think yeah, about. Yeah. And of course, all of us know these gentlemen, uh, McInturf and Yang and Peter Hart. Uh, we've hung on every word they've said on so many conference calls leading up to this election. We knew something was coming. We knew something was brewing. Uh, someone tonight called Donald Trump the, the shiny vehicle of change. This change was coming. They were going to hop on a car, get in it, and go. Um, One new, of the, the yeah. new car smell. Yeah, that's, that's right. New, that was two years rage. ago. That was Obama in 2014. Hey, let's record keep on this Senate race in Pennsylvania. Oh, We've please. talked about Pennsylvania so much, and the incumbent is going back. Pat Toomey. Chris Matthews is shaking I'm his head because, because of all the predictions I got from the experts up there. Uh, Toomey, but I did get a good call from, and James knows this Pennsylvania very well. He's won many races up there. Uh, that. Uh, People like Rendell, the governor, would say, who works with us now, said that uh, that uh, Hillary would have to win by four for her to get in. She would be the coattails to bring her in. But Pennsylvania, 
is in a mood right now. I can tell you, I talked to my brother. He said all these people showed up at the polls he'd never seen before in Montgomery County. And he said they're older than he'd ever seen at the polls. And they were all concerned conservatives about the Supreme Court. So Trump going in there on guns and the Supreme Court issue at the very end, we may not appreciate that in New York or in Washington, but up there, it taps yep. something. And they said, I'll even put up with Trump, who I consider immoral and awful, to get my court protected. It does, you know, it is, it, this is a really important moment for the Supreme Court, and the Republicans made a really radical decision when Antonin Scalia died that President Obama would not be allowed to even yeah. have his proposed nominee considered. Um, I, I do think that it's now... I think that Roe versus Wade is at risk. Oh. I think that with right. uh, with Republicans in control of the House and the Senate and likely the White House, that means, as James said earlier, that Obamacare, they've got everything in place to 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 repeal it. Uh, they've got everything in place they need to repeal Dodd-Frank. They've got everything in place they need to do whatever Trump wants to do on immigration, which I do not think will be immigration reform and or anything that we've seen that looks like that. So they've got, I mean, I think Roe versus Wade has never been more at risk uh, than it will be with, with President. President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence there uh, lighting a fire under that issue and a Supreme Court theirs to pave the way they want. I have to interrupt here just to say Kristen Wilker standing by at Clinton headquarters uh, to talk to us. Kristen, am I correct that we're going to hear from John Podesta assumed from the podium? Well, here's what we know, Brian. He is headed over here. What's significant about that is that the Clinton campaign has largely gone dark for well over an hour now. Let me just take you through what happened. He was at the Peninsula Hotel here in New York watching returns with Secretary Clinton. He started to leave the hotel, encountered reporters who asked him for reaction to the results so far. He didn't have any. And then they said, are you going over to the Javits Center? Yes, he is coming here. Uh, but he did not say whether or not he was going to actually speak. We anticipate we will hear from him. That would make sense. Uh, he is not, or he did not indicate that Secretary Clinton would be coming over with him. In fact, when he was asked directly, is Secretary Clinton coming to the Javits Center? He said, no. No, I am going. Uh, so this is significant again because there is movement uh, from within the Clinton campaign headquarters and we are going to uh, in some way, shape or form likely get some uh, reaction from the chairman. Uh, let me just set the scene here, Brian, inside the Javits Center. A number of people have left in tears. There is stunned disbelief as these results as they come in. Uh, earlier in the evening, they were looking for any sign that there was a potential path forward when the results of Nevada, for example, came in. Uh, the crowd burst into cheers. But now, really, it's just silence as they listen to the music playing and await to hear uh, what happens next. Brian. Kristen Welker at Clinton headquarters. James Carville has joined us. I'm sorry? No. Maine. We, we have a projection. Maine. It is being projected by NBC News will be won by Hillary Clinton when all the votes are cast. Three out of the four electoral votes. So that means we are not projecting the separate congressional district that... No. Okay. <laughs> Donald Trump gets one. Ah, okay. So you'll Got note it. his total has grown by one. What a fascinating and confusing... Using and so to be clear, yes. of the uh, to be clear, yeah. Maine one of the congr one of the electoral votes in Maine goes to Trump. The remaining electoral votes yes. in Maine go to Hillary. Clinton. We're working on a new graph that says she gets most of them. Yes. Yeah. All right. Exactly. I was saying that James Carville has been kind enough to.